as we continue our study in the Gospel of John, it's always good for us to go back and revisit the clear purpose statement that the author provided for his readers almost 2,000 years ago. I would dare say it's the clearest purpose statement of any book in Scripture. It's just very much laid out for you. Where is it laid out? It's in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. We'll put it up here on the screen for you so that you can take a look at it. If you'd like to turn there, you're more than welcome to. Here's the purpose statement that John provides. Why did he write this gospel? He tells us, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, those that are written, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. A Greek word for Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. Why is a statement like this so important? Well, one reason is that it helps us to consider every part of the book as we take a closer look at any given passage. So armed with that purpose statement, you can read any verse or set of verses in this book and you can ask yourself the question, how does this passage in particular help John accomplish his purpose in presenting Jesus? How does it fit into the whole? How does it serve that greater good in this book? So let's keep that purpose statement in mind as we return to our study of John's gospel this morning. So if you haven't already, turn over there, look with me at verses 25 through 36 of John chapter 7. You may recall, a little review here going back to the beginning of chapter 1. You may recall that Jesus, unlike his half-brothers, chose not to go up to Jerusalem in any kind of public way for the Feast of Booths. Instead, he went up later and privately, as the opening verses tell us in John chapter 7. But we heard that his pri- we saw that his private pilgrimage to Jerusalem, his p- private pilgrimage to the feast, led to very public teaching in the temple. He was not on some kind of stealth mission. He wasn't lurking in the shadows, trying to keep an eye on everybody. He went up quietly, but when he got there, he taught publicly. Verses 14 through 24 of this chapter describe for us how Jesus was interacting with both the crowds who were there for the feasts and with some of the Jewish leaders who were there keeping an eye on Jesus. We also know from the opening verses of this chapter that they were there because they had plotted to kill Jesus. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to figure out a way to be able to get him. So with the scene set, take a look. Look with me at verse 25. Let's pick up the story there. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man? This is Jesus teaching in the temple. Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? Now, sidebar, side note. (laughs) Clearly, this is a group of people who are aware of the conspiracy. They're aware of the talking amongst the Jewish leaders. Maybe they're kind of higher-ups in the the social hierarchy of Jerusalem. For whatever reason, they're aware of that. We know earlier that many in the crowd had no idea that the leaders were so bent on capturing Jesus and killing Jesus. Therefore, when he mentioned the fact that they wanted to kill him, they thought he was demon-possessed. They thought he was out of his mind. This group, this sum, S-O-M-E, this sum is aware of that. So they say, verse 25, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, (laughs) speaking openly, And they say nothing to him? Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ, the Messiah, appears, no one will know where he comes from. 
So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, he's faithful, and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. So they, now it's not clear who the they is. It could be this group, this more powerful little bit of aristocracy or somebody, the higher-ups, not the leaders though. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, Will, will he do more signs than this man has done? A rhetorical question. Look at the signs that he's doing. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and obviously they were not happy about that. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks? That's Jews who are living in the Greek and Roman Greek world. Does he plan to go to them, the diaspora, and to teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and, and where I am you cannot come? Now let's stop there. I want you to notice here two rather obvious realities. I think you probably sensed it as we, was, we were reading through this. First of all, notice the uncertainty of the Jews. They are all over the board here, right? <laughs> and if you keep reading, let me tell you, it does not get any better <laughs> at all. They are all over the board. Aside from a portion of the people who believed in him, according to verse 31, most of those who are listening to and interacting with Jesus here seem thoroughly confused. Those who know something of the leadership's plot to kill Jesus are uncertain about why they are still allowing him to teach publicly. Publicly, uh, In light of their failure to act, these people are also uncertain about what these leaders really believe about Jesus. Uh, could they, might they now believe that he's actually the Messiah? What does all of this mean? Uncertainty, confusion. In addition to this, some of the leaders apparently are uncertain about how to handle Jesus. In verse 33, we also read that some of the leaders are uncertain about where Jesus is going when he tells them that he will go someplace where he cannot be found. They are clearly confused about what he's telling them there. If we drop down past our main passage down to verses 40 and 41 of this same chapter, take a look, 40 and 41, we also find this same confusion and uncertainty about the identity of Jesus we read, when they heard these words, some of the people, there's that group again, some of the people, could be a different group altogether, they said, this really is the prophet. Deuteronomy 18, the prophet that Moses said would rise up after him, that would be like him. Others said, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Really? Even the temple police officers, I like calling them police officers, like the temple guard, right? These police officers, they were dispatched, right, in verse 32. Did you see that? They were dispatched in verse 32. Even they are uncertain about their orders to arrest Jesus. How do we know that they were uncertain? They came back empty-handed. Look at verse 45 of this chapter. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? We gave you a job to do. You come back empty-handed. So, what do we make of all this? It's obvious here that John wants us to see 
the widespread confusion and uncertainty of the Jewish people and Jewish leaders regarding Jesus. Do you see that? He wants to make it perfectly clear. There is no, there is no agreement here about who Jesus is. He's, he's creating a lot of issues, right? People are uncertain. They are confused. He wants us to appreciate this widespread confusion and uncertainty among the Jews. Though the signs of Jesus, the signs that we've been looking at, the seven signs of Jesus contained, preserved in this book, though those signs, those miracles of Jesus are powerful, though they are persuasive, most of these people that we read about here remain unconvinced. As, the, as verse 43 concludes, so there was a division among the people over him. They don't know what to think. They can't agree with each other. They're all over the board. Some love him, some want to kill him. Why highlight this uncertainty for us? Because John is setting the stage for the cross. John is setting the stage for the cross. And he wants us to understand, he wants us to appreciate what's happening here among the people and among the religious leaders, all of whom will play a role in that great drama, won't they? All of who will be involved there in the shadow of the cross. But this uncertainty, <laughs> this uncertainty also wonderfully underscores, second, the certainty of Jesus. The certainty of Jesus. This passage is com composed of five sections that alternate between his Jewish listeners and the words of Jesus himself. Jewish listeners, Jesus. Jewish listeners, Jesus. Jewish li listeners. That's what it does. His first statement here is a response to the Jews who said, we know this guy. Ah, Jesus. We know this guy. We know him. Do you remember verse 42 of the previous chapter? You can look back there if you want. Chapter 6, verse 42. It says, they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Wow, that took place in Capernaum, but you can get a sense of the same idea here. And these people who were talking here about knowing Jesus, they might have been pilgrims from Capernaum who were well aware of Jesus and his ministry in Galilee, in northern Israel. Verse 28 of our chapter, Jesus, what do we see? Jesus concedes their point, but corrects their arrogance. He concedes their point by saying, yeah, you know me. I know you know me. I know you know my address, house up on the hill. I know you know my parents. I know who, you know who they are. You know, I know you know a, a number of things about me. But he also corrects their arrogance here. You know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. Guess what he's saying? He's saying, you might think you know me, but that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. You see, I've been sent on a mission. I've come with a purpose that transcends Nazareth, that transcends Mary and Joseph, that transcends all the things that you, with which you want to frame me and define my story. It's much bigger than that. I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, faithful, reliable, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him and he sent me. Do you hear the certainty dripping from these words? <laughs> like I said, it's like stark contrast, isn't it? It just pops out here in, in, in relief, like, whoa, with all this confusion and uncertainty abounding in this, in this passage. Throughout this passage and throughout this gospel, John wants to make it crystal clear that there is no confusion, there is no hesitation, there is no speculation with Jesus. 
There is only certainty. Do you appreciate that point? John is presenting a clear view of Jesus in which there is no speculation, there is no hesitation, there is no confusion, there is only certainty when it comes to Jesus. The second statement from Jesus is found in verses 33 and 34. The first one was addressing those who said, I know, we know him. But this is where Jesus speaks to the question of timing. Look at how he does so. How can, the, uh, how can the leaders allow this man to be teaching is what some of the crowd said, right? How can they keep, let, keep here he is, he's right here. Why, why, why isn't somebody going to get this guy? Why isn't somebody pulling him to the side? Where are the temple guards in all of this? This question of timing, when will they arrest him? Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he is in charge of the timeline, not the Jewish authorities. He is in charge of the timeline. Look at, look at verses 33 and 34. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. You guys, can, you guys have your plot. You have your plans. You have your agenda. You have your timeline. But guess what? Most powerful people in Jerusalem, aside from the Romans, guess what? None of that matters. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because there is a plan. There is a purpose. There are plans, there are purposes being fulfilled and worked out, even as we speak, Jesus is saying, you will, you will come looking for me and I will be gone, and where I'm going, you cannot come. Apart from new birth, you cannot come. Again, such absolute certainty as Jesus speaks. Even the gospel writer communicates this same certainty in verse 30. Did you see that? So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John has no problem with that statement. His hour had not yet come. The apostle John understood what Jesus understood. Our, our certainty rests on his sovereignty. Our certainty rests on his sovereignty. God is in charge is all that sovereignty means. God is fully in charge. The question was not, what did the Jewish leaders have in store for Jesus? Oh, tell me, when is this going to happen? The ultimate question was, what has God decreed for Jesus? If John is setting the stage here for the cross, like we talked about, then he wants to stress what another apostle, the apostle Peter, would later announce to the crowds at yet another Jewish festival, the festival, the Feast of Pentecost. This is what Peter said. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He was delivered up according to the definite plan. That's, the same, that's just Peter speak for what John is saying here. The hour has not yet come. Of course they're not going to arrest him because God has not permitted it to happen. It's not part of the timeline. The certainty of Jesus exemplified here was not lost on all his listeners, was it? These words dripping with certainty, remember those temple police officers? God bless them. Or as they say in the South, Lord, love them. Lord, love them. Look at the whole exchange in verses 45 and 46. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Now let's be clear. Anyone, 
anyone can speak with an air of certainty, but still be full of baloney. Right? We know that. Anyone can speak with an air of certainty, but still be full of baloney. We find an example of that very thing here in verse 27. It's right here in the passage. Some in the crowd said, but we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. This sounds pretty, they sound pretty certain, don't they? Like they're quoting some textbook or something. Of course, they're absolutely mistaken, and the correction itself comes down in verse 42 of this same chapter. Look at verse 42. Here's the correction. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So right there, it's, it's obvious. That is the correct take, right? We know that that's what Micah 5.2 says. Now, that was being used, of course, against Jesus because he was thought to have been solely from Galilee, from northern Israel, far from Bethlehem. But the point is clear there that anyone can speak with an air of certainty. It doesn't mean that they're correct, though. So, Jesus was not only certain. He was certainly correct. He was not only certain in the way he, in the way he spoke, he was certainly divine. Again, what would John want us to know about why we can trust the certainty of Jesus? Remember chapter 5. Chapter 5 tells us because of three things, three things John gives us here that testify clearly to the identity of Jesus. The scriptures, the seal of approval that God spoke from heaven to John the Baptist, and the signs themselves. Scripture seal signs. These miraculous signs themselves testify to who Jesus is. They support his certainty, the way that he speaks. It's not just an air of certainty. He is certain, and he is certainly correct. He is certainly divine. Brothers and sisters, friends, does the certainty of Jesus inspire certainty in you? A question for reflection and then application. Does the certainty of Jesus inspire certainty in you. Think about this. How you live your life, picture it in your head, how you live your life, the patterns of your every day, your defaults, who you are when no one is looking, those are an expression of that about which you are most certain. Let me say that again. The way you live your life, how you live your life, your everyday patterns, your defaults, who you are when no one is looking, those are an expression of that about which you are most certain. And so, if we are to live our lives faithfully and fully for the glory of God, we should seek to be certain as Jesus was certain. Make sense? If that's your desire as a follower of Jesus is to exalt Christ and glorify the Father, to do His work in this world, to be about His mission, uh, to, to, to honor Him in every way, to follow His lead, then the pattern of your life needs to track with God's will, right? It needs to track with what God has designed for you. Therefore, we need to be certain if our life is lived out of this sense of certainty about certain things. We want to grow. We want to be certain as Jesus was certain. Remember the opening words of Luke's gospel? Let me remind you of those. Take a look here on the screen. He tells his reader, the book is dedicated to a gentleman it says that, he tells his reader that it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. You see, here's the inspired writer of Scripture. 
who will write for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, which will serve for us as part of the word of the living God. And the goal of Luke is that this word would, would create certainty in the reader. Therefore, even now today, as we read not just Luke and Acts, but as we read all of God's word, God's goal is that you would be certain. You would be certain of these things. He wants you to grow in that way. That's exactly the heart on display in Luke here. He wants you to grow. He wants Theophilus to grow in this very way. Now, in the same way, John also wrote letters. He didn't just write the gospel. He wrote letters, short ones. We find at the end of the New Testament, he wrote letters to the believers in Asia Minor to inspire this same kind of certainty. I write these things to you, says John, that y- to, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. That you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13. Certainty. Is that a goal in your Christian life? As you seek to know and grow in God, as you seek to walk with Jesus, is certainty something that you're moving towards, that you desire to grow in? But at the same time, the Scriptures also remind us that Uncertainty is no stranger to the Christian life. Uncertainty. For example, Jesus, take a look. Jesus speaking about his second coming said, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father, Mark 13, 32. And he reemphasized this point for his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Obviously, there's uncertainty because of that. Can we be certain that Jesus will return? Yes. Can we be certain when Jesus will return? No. Certainty? Uncertainty. Paul made it clear that we know in part and we prophesy in part that now we see in a mirror dimly. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 and 12. Because that's true, brothers and sisters, there will be many things about which you and I will be uncertain in this life. When it comes to following Jesus, uncertainty is par for the course. Certainty and uncertainty. Maybe this morning you're battling uncertainty. Maybe you feel like you're drowning in uncertainty. Uncertain about what this or that in your life means uncertain about how things will turn out, uncertain about what others really think, uncertain about what you really believe, uncertain about where you should go or what you should do. If that's you, and please believe me, that is all of us at some point, in some way. If that's you this morning, then how does God want to encourage you this day? How does he want to encourage you? I believe that we've already touched on a couple ideas that are worth going back to. How does God want to encourage you this morning? First, he wants your certainty to rest on his sovereignty. He wants your certainty to rest on his sovereignty. Remember, that simply means that God's in charge fully. He's in charge. You may not know how things will go. You may not know what this or that means. But oftentimes, it's enough that God knows. 
It should be enough that God knows. He knows everything. Even more than that, he's in control. Certainty simply means trusting that God will accomplish his perfect plan. That's the ground, that's the root of our certainty in Christ. You may not know, but it should be enough that God knows. Do you believe that this morning? Second, God wants the certainty. He wants the certainty of Jesus to inspire certainty in you. He wants the signs to persuade you. He wants the testimony of the scriptures to strengthen you. He wants you to respond to the words of Jesus in the same way the temple guards responded. No one has ever spoken like this man. Though you and I are inundated every single day with words, 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 everywhere, all the time, words spoken on paper, words everywhere. Though we are inundated every day, God wants us to exclaim every day, no one has ever spoke like this man. No one. You see, if you're, not in, if you're not in the Word of God on a regular basis, you don't believe that. Just be honest with yourself. Don't play games with yourself. You don't really believe that. You believe that there are many other words that are far more important because you're gravitating, you're going to those, you're grabbing those and listening to them. You're exalting them and saying, there's something unique here, there's something that I need. And wonderfully, there are a lot of great resources inside and outside the church by God's special grace and common grace in the world. There's many good resources to help us with a whole variety of things. But at the end of the day, if Christ is first in our lives, then his word will be first. It will have pride of place. It will be the priority. No one ever spoke like this man. Jesus was certain about who he was. Jesus was certain about the Father. He was certain about his relationship with God. He was certain about God's timing and God's plan. He was certain about all of it. This morning, we can savor that certainty together, can't we? We can rejoice in that certainty. And as we go our separate ways, we can and we should continue to savor his certainty. Why is the certainty of Jesus so important? Because it not only encourages us to have confidence in his words, but also confidence in his work. His work on the cross for stubborn sinners like us, Jesus Christ was not an unsure Savior. He was a certain Savior. He didn't give his life hoping it would help. He sacrificed himself certain of the outcome, certain of our deliverance. There was no trepidation he wasn't haltingly moving towards the cross. He wasn't unsure about what his father would do. You see, that's the savior we need. This is the redeemer we need, one who is certain. How often are we tossed and tempted by our uncertainties? Right now, you may be, as I said, struggling with certainty, uncertainty. You may be drowning. Feel like you're drowning in a sea of uncertainties. And that's par for the course for our human lives, isn't it, in a fallen world. That's just the way it is. But in those uncertainties, there are temptations. There are choices. 
you will either look to God or you will look to the world. You will look to some other worldly human construct to be able to give you some certainty in light of the uncertainties. You will look to those instead of God. So we are often tossed and tempted by our uncertainties. And think about this. How often are we sinfully certain of our own wisdom and power and plans? Oh, I'm certain I've got this. I'm certain this will work out. I'm certain. And yet that certainty flows from our own pride, doesn't it? It flows from our own pride. So we're tossed and tempted by our uncertainties. We're often sinfully certain of our own wisdom, power, and plans. Uncertainty can swallow sinners like us, and our so-called certainty can deceive us. Why do I mention these things? Because these are simply reminders to us, reminders of how much we need Jesus and his certainty. You see, left to our own devices, left on our own, both uncertainty and and certainty will be the end of us. (laughs) It'll be our undoing without his grace. We desperately need Jesus and his certainty. It's through him and only through him that we can know the certainty that God's word wants to cultivate in us. Certainty through the Spirit that Jesus Christ himself gives. Certainty of that faith, which is according to Ephesians 2.8, the gift of God. Do you want that certainty this morning? Do you want to grow in that way? Let's talk to God this morning about our uncertainties in light of the certainty of Jesus. The fact that you have uncertainties is not the problem. The question is, where will you go with those uncertainties? Where will your certainty be found? On what rock will that, what what rock is your certainty, the one you're standing on? We need to go to the certainty of Jesus that is just underscored by this passage that God has given us this morning. May God help us to grow in that certainty so that others may be persuaded by the testimony of our lives as we share the testimony about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's spend a minute talking.